All right, let's uh, continue. The next question is, uh, what is the atomic density of this pure silicon? So we have seen this unit cell before. And then we can practice this question using the same method as we used for the corpus atomic density in the lecture two. So how do we approach this question? Similarly, we can count how many silicon atoms within this unit cell. So number of silicon atoms So I like to have someone to type in any possible answers from the chat. If you look at the unit cell structure like this, how many atoms you think are within this unit cell? Any volunteer from the chat here? Let me show you the structure like this. How many silicon atoms are within this unit cell? Any guess? Guess? Okay, I got some answers. Eight. That is correct. So this is different from the copper. If you recall the copper case, we have four. So here, how do we get eight? Again, we can use the same approach. Look at the atoms at the corners first. So one eighth of those atoms belong to this unit cell. How many of them? You have eight corners. You have one eighth times eight. And then we can look at the atoms to the center of the face. So half of the atom belong to this unit cell. How many of them? You have six faces. So here, this is the same as copper so far. But uh, what is different in the silicon is that you have four additional uh, atoms fully reside in this unit cell. Those four. So in to plus four, so in total here you got eight. And then the atomic density, you can use this eight and then divide it by the volume of this unit cell which is this lattice constant A, and you know the volume is A cube. So here you can convert the unit and uh, angstrom, as we discussed before, is uh, one tenth of the nanometer. And then you need to convert the nanometer with a centimeter, so you have this 10 to the power negative 7 as a ratio. And then if you do this calculation, eventually you will get atomic density 5 times 10 to the power 22 per centimeter cube. So this is the atomic density of the silicon. Or in other words, within 1 centimeter cube volume, you will have 5 times 10 to the power 22 atoms. Then, how many shell electron den uh, uh, in the silicon? So, shell electron density will be four times this atomic density. Why is that? Because as we discussed before, one silicon atom will have four shell electron. So, then you need to multiply by four here. So, you get two times 10 to the power 23 per centimeter cubed. But this is a shell electron density. This is not the free electron density we discussed earlier. Because the free electron 
in this pure silicon will be created by the thermal energy. So you break up this bond. Once you break up the bond, you get the free electron. So how many free, free electron? So this depends on the temperature. You know, at zero, absolute zero Kelvin, then it's zero. But with, at room temperature, you have some probability to break up the bond. And here, this is the free electron density at room temperature. It's 10 to the power 10 per centimeter cubed. So this number is pretty low compared to the shell electron density. If you look at the ratio of those two, actually you can draw the conclusion. Only roughly next one out of 10 to the power 13 bonds is broken at the room temperature in silicon. Why is that? Because you look at the ratio here. So that means the probability to break up the bond is pretty low in the silicon at the room temperature. So this is the pure silicon. In the pure silicon, the way you create the electron and hole is to increase the temperature. So the higher the temperature, then this free carrier density will be larger. So here we say carrier. The reason is that this carrier can be both electron or hole because both can conduct the current. Electron flow and hole flow are equivalent. And uh, as we discussed earlier, once you create one electron, you create one hole. So if you think of the free electron density, we use N represent that. And the hole density, we use P represent that. So the pure silicon will have N equals to P. And this number is 10 to the power 10 centimeter cube or centimeter cube at room temperature. Any questions? All right. So next, we are going to discuss how to further increase the electron or the hole density in the silicon. Because you say that this probability is pretty low. That means even at room temperature, the silicon is not very conductive. Because only one out of 10 to the power 13 is broken. So the way to further increase the electron or the hole density is to do this so-called doping process. I been doping. So this is called doping. So doping means what? You add impurity into the silicon. You add impurity. Oops. You add impurity to the silicon. And now the silicon becomes non-intrinsic silicon. Without doping, the silicon is called pure silicon or intrinsic silicon. But after you add impurity, let's say other atoms into the silicon, then this becomes a non-intrinsic silicon. So what kind of impurity we can introduce? So if you look at the periodic table here, the labels of the silicon, for example, in the group 5, we have the phosphorus. Or sometimes you can use arsenic. So if you inject phosphorus into the silicon, then this is called the adding donor to the silicon. So think about this silicon atom is replaced by the phosphorus atom. Then what will happen? Phosphorus, you know, is group five elements. That means it has five shell electrons. But here, for the silicon crystal, you only need four shell electrons to form those four bonds with its neighbors. So that means you will have one more additional electron from the phosphorus because it has five. 
So this additional electron becomes a free electron, which can be moved under the electric field. So here is the phosphorus, or in general, the group 5 element is called donors, because you donate one more electron to the silicon system. And once you donate one electron to the silicon, this is a free electron, so the phosphorus atom itself will carry a positive charge in the center. Why is that? Because you have to maintain the charge neutral. Uh, before you do the doping, silicon is charge neutral, and you add one more phosphorus atom, which is also charge neutral. So in total, still, the system is charge neutral. And now you can see that one phosphorus atom contributes to one free electron. So the free electron density is totally controlled by the doping density. So here is the donor doping density. So we use Nd represents the donor doping density, and N is the free electron density. So in the following lectures, we will skip the free here. But as you know, when we talk about the electron density in this course, we mean the free electron density, which you can move. So we use small n represent that. So this n equals to nd because it's one to one mapping here. Any questions? So this is the uh, adding group five elements. Similarly, what you can do is to add group 3 element. In this case, boron is typically used. And group 3 element, you know, only has 3 shell electrons. But still, if you replace silicon atom with the boron atom here, you will form those 4 bonds. But 4 bonds, you need 4 electrons. So that means here you need to somehow borrow one pose from somewhere because here the boron only contributes three three, uh, three shell electrons and then if, if you need one more you need to somehow create the electron and hole pair to borrow one electron here that means at the same time you introduce one hole Again, the boron atom will be negative charge in the center because we need to make the charge neutral. Once you introduce additional hole into the system, then the boron center will be negative charge because hole is positive charge. So this is uh, called acceptor. This boron is called acceptor. Why acceptor? Because it accepts one additional electron and then creates one hole. So this acceptor doping density, we use Na for that. And then you can see that this is again one-to-one -one mapping. You have one boron atom, you have one additional hole. So we use P represents the hole density. So then P equals to Na. To summarize here, when a semiconductor material is doped with donors, it has more mobile, or let's say free electrons, than the holes. It is called N-type semiconductor. So here, for example, if we dope silicon with phosphorus, then you make it N-type, because now the Free electron density is determined by the donor's doping density, and you can dope more, and then you can have more free electrons. And when a semiconductor material is doped with acceptors, for example, the boron, then it will have more mobile holes than the electrons. This is called p-type semiconductor. As we discussed earlier, no matter which kind of doping you use, 
the system is still charge neutral because before you do the doping, it's charge neutral. You add one atom, the atom is also charge neutral. So after doping, still the whole system is charge neutral. If you look at the, let's say, particles or species in this system, what do you have? You may have the electron, which is negative charge. And then you will have the, if you dope with p-type, you will have like the boron center, which is also negative charged. Then on the positive side, you have the hole, which is positive charge. And then you may have the donor. Sorry, donor is ND. Like the phosphorus atom center is also positive charged. So always you will have this kind of equation. All the negative charge equals to all the positive charge. So this n-type and p-type doping is very important for making the silicon chips because later you will see that all the functional devices are made of this so-called CMOS technology. And CMOS is short for complementary and MOS, M-O-S. So this complementary means N-type and P-type complementary. Any questions? All right. Then let's look at this question. What is the reasonable number of the dopants in the number of per centimeter cubed? So basically, what is the doping density? So this is what you can control as a chip manufacturer. You can dope the silicon typically in the range from like 10 to power 15 to 8, 5 times 10 to power 18 per centimeter cube. This is the typical doping density range. That means if you dope the silicon with the phosphorus with this kind of density, that means your ND equals to this number. Then, as we discussed earlier, one phosphorus atom will introduce one free electron. So your N is the same. So now you can change your electron density by controlling the doping density. And then you can have this range. So to the high end of the doping, for example, if it's 5 times 10 to the power 18, per centimeter cubed. That means what? If you recall, we calculated the atomic density, which is 5 times 10 to the power 22. So you look at the ratio here. If you dope the silicon with this kind of impurity level, it's like 0.1% of the silicon atom is replaced by your phosphorus atom. So if you look at the ratio of this one and the ratio of the atomic density, so you see for the high end, you can dope as much as this kind of 5 times 10 to the power 18 per centimeter cubed. So you still can maintain this kind of crystal structure. Basically, you just replace the silicon atom with the phosphorus atom. But overall, the whole system is maintaining this kind of crystal structure. If you further dope, then you cannot maintain this kind of crystal structure. Then it will become like more like alloy of two kinds of elements. So this is uh, uh, for the n-type doping. Similarly, you can have uh, the p-type doping. If you dope the silicon with boron with this kind of density, 10 to the power 15 to 5 times 10 to 18, then your whole density will be in this range. So you will notice that this n or p will be much larger than the free carrier density as we discussed earlier. So here the 
free carrier density for the intrinsic silicon, as we discussed earlier, is n equals to p equals to this 10 to the power 10. So this is due to the thermal vibration to break up the bond. So this is thermal and the bond breaking. So this probability is very low, as we discussed. So we can only introduce so much electron hole at room temperature. This is at room temperature. And in this intrinsic silicon case, n always equals to p, because one electron, one hole is a pair. But in this non-intrinsic doping case, then if you dope the silicon with phosphorus n-type doping, you have n in this range, the p will be much smaller. So we will calculate what is the p in this case in the next lecture. But in this case, you should know that in the n-type doping, n is much larger than p. And in the p-type doping, because p is in this range, so p will be much larger than n. Alright, so the take home message is that to make silicon more conductive, to be practical, to build the integrated circuit, then we need to dope the silicon with those N type or P type doping to further increase the, let's say, the electron density or the hole density in the silicon. This is much higher density than the intrinsic free carrier density, which is introduced by the thermal bound breaking. And the thermal bound breaking can only be tuned by the temperature, but the external doping is what you can do as a manufacturer. You can control your doping density. Any questions? I got one question. How do you decide which semiconductor to use because they pretty much both do the same thing? Uh, are you talking about N-type versus P-type? You talk about whether we should dope with N-type or P-type. Okay, so that's a good question. But as later we show the practical circuit uh, built of the silicon, you will see that we need both N-type and P-type to make the circuit functional. So, so we need both. It's not just N or P. So we will, we will need both. We will talk about that later in the following lectures. And one more question, just to go back, how did we arrive at the number for the intrinsic free carrier density? Okay, so we didn't uh, derive that in the lecture. It's a very complicated uh, uh, derivation, so we didn't do the derivation, but just to give you the number here. Uh, this number can be derived by some complicated equations. I think if you refer to the reference book, you may find the derivation. But this is a function of temperature. So here at the room temperature, we just give you the number. It's 10 to the power 10 per centimeter cubed. If you are at higher temperature, then this number will further increase. And in this course, we don't require how to derive this uh, a free carrier density. For your interest, you can refer to the reference book. All right. So, any other questions before we end today? I got one more question. Is the intrinsic free carrier density for all metals or just uh, silicon? So, this is for silicon. Uh, this 10 to the power 10 at room temperature is for silicon only. For other semiconductors, you may have other numbers. But uh, for metal, it's different. The metal, as we discussed in the last lecture, it only has electrons. It will not have hole. The hole is a unique particle in the semiconductor. 
All right. Any other question? And you may expect that the first homework to be announced maybe later this week, and then you can start working on that uh, maybe later this week.